again, this is How Do I Grow in Christ? Uh, I've already talked to some people that didn't make it here to this class yesterday, so if this is a, this, that's what class this is. Uh, if you're just finding this class for the first time, that's where, that's where you're, if that's where you want to be, that's where you are. How Do I Grow in Christ? There's another classroom three. I said that yesterday. Uh, that's on the other side of, uh, of the road, on the beach side, too. So this is How Do I Grow in Christ? And uh, today we're going to be uh, moving on and talking about listening to God's Word. But before we do that, let's review just a little bit uh, about what we talked about yesterday. Yesterday we talked about how if we're going to grow in Christ, we need to understand that it's all about relationships. We need to understand God as somebody who we can know uh, through the work of Christ and somebody we can know intimately, uh, not just somebody to know about, okay, like you study a historical figure in a textbook or something, you can know about them, but you can't actually know them. Um, God is, uh, is living and active. Uh, he's real. And we don't just know about Him. Uh, we actually can know, know God. And I said yesterday that uh, our relationship with God, if we are in a relationship with Him because of the work of Christ and because of the work of the Holy Spirit, um, we should view our relationship with Him as a bride would, would view uh, their bridegroom. And the time and period in our lives we live right now is likened in, in the Scriptures to that of someone who's engaged to be married. That's kind of how we ended it yesterday. And, and those who are engaged, they long for more out of their relationships. Um, and they don't only long for more out of their relationships, they work hard to get that. Um, they work very hard in preparation for, um, for that day. Uh, and, and we should too. Uh, we should long for more out of our relationship with God, um, and, uh, and we should work hard using the tools that God has given us to know Him. Uh, specifically, He's given us His Word, and He's given us uh, prayer and, and other things that we'll also uh, mention on Friday. But today we're going to talk about His Word and, uh, and learning to listen to God's Word. Yesterday I told you a little bit about my wife. I told you a little bit of my story and meeting her and, uh, and, and marrying her. Uh, I didn't mention anything yesterday, the fact that I have, uh, I have some children. I have two boys, uh, one of my, uh, my greatest joys uh, and one of my greatest uh, frustrations in life is being a father uh, to two young boys. I have two sons. Uh, Drew will turn eight this Saturday, and Ben will turn four in August. So right now I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. And there are a lot of fun things about being a father, a lot of hard things about being a father. But one of the funnest things... Uh, about being a dad is getting to teach my boys stuff, um, getting to train them and teach them things, trying to uh, make sure they learn things that will help them mature and grow up and, uh, and understand who God is and understand how to live in the world uh, that He has created and how to enjoy Him and how to enjoy the world that God has created. And there's I mean, countless examples of things that I could uh, share with you that uh, you know, you get to do as a dad and get to teach your child as a dad. I'm going to share a couple this morning uh, as, a, as kind of an opening illustration as we get into this idea of listening to God and learning from God. Um, right now, currently, I'm trying to teach my youngest son, Ben, how to swim. Okay? Now, he's young for that. Some of you may have learned to swim really young. My oldest son, Drew, learned it at a pretty early age. And Ben, who is three going on four, is wanting to learn. And we live right next door to my wife's parents, and they have a pool so we can kind of walk across the yard and swim every day uh, in the evenings. And we try to, and I've been trying to teach Ben how to swim. Now, a frustrating thing about teaching, or, or complicating things, I guess, about teaching a child something, and if you've ever tried to teach a child something, you understand this. You might have little brothers and sisters, or you might have uh, tried to teach, whether it be in Sunday school or VBS, you might have done that, that sort of thing in your church. Uh, one, you have to communicate well. And you have to use language that they can understand. Um, and two, they have to listen to you. Okay? They have to listen and try to understand what you're saying or else they're never going to get it. Now, Ben is a motor mouth. He never shuts up. Now, if he met you for the first time, he wouldn't say anything for about 30 minutes. But if he knows you, he never stops talking. So imagine trying to teach something to a child who doesn't stop talking long enough to listen. Okay, so I'm trying to teach him how to swim, and I keep telling him and telling him and telling him. That every time I'm talking, he's talking. Um, needless to say, as hard as we've worked this summer on swimming, Ben does not, has not learned yet. Okay? Part of it's his age, but part of it, a big part of it is he won't listen to anything I tell him. I go over there, and I try to talk over him, and he's just saying, but daddy, but daddy, but daddy, but daddy, I want to do this, and I'll get it. You know, so he's still learning. He hasn't learned it primarily because he won't listen to me. Uh, it might be also that I'm not a great communicator with him, and I'm not. But 
Mainly, he won't listen. Um, contrasting illustration, teaching my older son something different. Uh, another thing that I've enjoyed teaching both of my sons uh, is, is how to hunt. I don't know anybody in here lives in places and, and like to hunt and have opportunities to hunt and fish and those sorts of things. Some of y'all. Um, where I live in Louisiana, that's a, that's a big part of kind of what people do in um, it's a big part of what I grew up doing, and so I have a lot of fun teaching my sons um, how to hunt. And I will say this, my oldest son, Drew, I'm going to brag on him, but he has done remarkably well uh, learning how to hunt. Um, he has had a great amount of success hunting at a very early age, uh, much more than I ever did, uh, and, and much more than I think I see a lot of his friends uh, even having. And, and a, the reason, I think, is because he listens. Uh, now, there's something interesting about hunting that helps a dad teach, uh, and it drives my wife crazy because she doesn't get to experience this because she doesn't hunt. She doesn't take my boys to the woods. Um, but if you're going to hunt something, the first thing you've got to do is be quiet. You're not going to kill anything in the woods if you're making noise, all right? And, and so built into the whole framework of hunting is this assumption that you've got to be quiet, all right? Now, from my perspective as a dad who wants to teach my son something, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, it drives my wife crazy when I come home and I say, I just spent four hours with Drew. He didn't say a word. You know, because he is a crazy child at home. You know, he's very energetic, very active. And he'll go sit still in the woods with me for three and four hours at a time and not say anything. And during that, I'm able to lean over to him and I'm, I'm able to say, okay, that's the type of bird you're seeing. But that's what you're hearing. That's the noise you're hearing in the woods. And this is what you should expect if this animal comes out. And, this, you know, and I'm able to teach him. And I'm able to, to tell him things. Um, and because of that, you know, he has, he's learning a lot. He's maturing at a very quick and fast rate when it comes to hunting things. I mean, he killed his first squirrel when he was four or five. He started hunting with me when he was about 18 months. In, um, in a backpack, squirrel hunting in a backpack. As soon as he could put his fingers in his ear when I would raise a gun, I'd practice at home with an unloaded gun. If I'd raise the gun and he put his fingers in his ear, he was ready to go. And um, he's been going with me ever since. But he killed his first squirrel at four or five, his first deer, his first dove when he was six. And, uh, and earlier this year, at, at age seven, he killed his first deer by himself, which if you hunt, you know that's actually illegal. A kid's not supposed to hunt by themselves. But I had both of my boys with me, and the youngest one had to go poo-poo. And you can't do that in a stand. And, uh, and I'm like, all right, Drew, we've got to leave you. We can't. I'm going to go get the four-wheeler. I'm going to come right back. Uh, and he insisted that he keep his gun with him. And I'm like, torn, do I do this, do I do this? Well, I come back 15 minutes later, and he has killed a huge deer. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, he was just like, Daddy, look what I did, look what I did. You know, age seven. But I was torn with that, but I also was not that torn because, you know, I, I felt a little bit of confidence. It freaked my wife out that I did that. She could not believe that I had left him alone with a large caliber rifle in the woods. Um, <laughs> but I told her, I said, I was torn, but the reality is, you know, for, he's seven, he started 18 months, for that many years, you know, four or five years now, he has sat there, uh, and, I, and he's given me his complete attention, and listened, and learned, and I was like, I was torn, because he is young, he is immature, he might do something stupid, um, but I also have a great measure of confidence in the kid, because he has listened. You know, he's learned a lot uh, about what to do, and, and how to do it in the woods. Anyway, I use that as an illustration for this because learning things, it, to learn something, it, it requires that we, that we listen. Um, and, uh, and I use the illustration of my oldest son listening in the woods because he has listened and he has, has matured rapidly when it comes to knowing what to do in the woods and how to, how to handle himself in the woods, uh, primarily because he, he, he was able to listen. Now, he doesn't listen in everything. There's a lot of things he doesn't listen at all. Um, but, uh, but with hunting, he has, and he's been very successful. Today... Um, I want us to, uh, to talk about what it means to listen to God and to listen to God's Word um, as a child listens to their father and learns from their father or learns from their parents. So that's where we're going to go today. Um, let's pray before we get started, though, okay? Let's pray. Great and Heavenly Father, I thank you so much again for this opportunity we have to uh, be here this week and to spend, um, spend this time away from our normal routines and to spend this time looking at your word and, uh, and listening to your word and 
I'm learning from you, Father. I pray this morning as we talk specifically about your word and how to, how to listen to it, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would help me speak clearly, and I pray that, uh, that we would be able to, uh, to learn some practical tools that will help us understand what you're saying to us um, and help us understand how to listen to you. Uh, Father, I ask all this in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, let me start off with some, uh, just some, some principles, some biblical principles. I want what I'd like to do today and tomorrow, um, as today we talk about God's Word and listening to it, and tomorrow as we talk about prayer and talking to God, I want to start off each day with some foundational kind of just observations from Scripture uh, about today God's Word and tomorrow about prayer. And then I want to try to get real practical with you about how do, you, how do we do this stuff, okay? And, um, and give you a bunch of suggestions. And in a minute, I'm going to give you suggestions, and I'm going to encourage you by giving you uh, the names of other books and things to help. And this is a short period of time. I can only tell you so much. But I'm going to give you some principles and encourage you uh, to run with those in hopes that one or two of those principles might catch your attention and, uh, and give you some tools and places to go to continue to grow in, in, in that. But let's start today with some basic principles before we even get to put a couple of points. Before we get to those... Let's just make some observations of things that we learn from God's Word. Um, yesterday we talked about how God brings us into a relationship with Him. And we talked about that relationship in terms of a bride with a bridegroom. Well, another aspect and another way that the Bible describes our relationship with Him is He says that if by faith in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, He has brought us into a relationship with Him, um, we are now received as children with our Heavenly Father. Um, one aspect of our relationship, biblically speaking, is that we have been adopted into God's family. Okay? Um, because of sin, we have to make the acknowledgement that not everyone is part of God's family. Um, we can't look at the world around us and say that everybody is a child of God. That's not biblically true. Um, biblically speaking, we're not born into God's family. Uh, we are adopted into God's family uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit bringing faith in our hearts and uniting us to Christ. Um, and so, if we have faith in Christ, it's because God, through the power of His Holy Spirit, has brought us uh, by adoption into His family, such that we are now children of God, sons and daughters of God. And this is an amazing reality. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, speaks of this reality. Um, if you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, just listen. In Galatians 4, 4 through 7, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Okay, so one aspect of our relationship with God is that we should see ourselves as children with our Heavenly Father. Um, and... One temptation there for us is to kind of uh, superimpose our understanding of, a, of our earthly father onto God. Um, and I can't speak for you, I don't know. Uh, for some of you, that might be a, a blessing and it might be a benefit. You might have a great relationship with your earthly father and that might help you tremendously um, in understanding. You know, your father might be demonstrating to you little bits and glimpses of what your heavenly father is like. Um, for others of you, that may not be the case. Um, Biblically speaking, though, we're, we need to not superimpose our understanding of our earthly father onto God, um, but we need to start rather with what the Bible tells us about God, our Heavenly Father's relationship with us. Uh, because all of our fathers, our earthly fathers, are broken. Um, no matter how great they might be, um, they only can give us little broken glimpses of the love that our Heavenly Father has for us. Um, but if you've ever longed uh, to... Be with your, heaven, with your earthly father to know him and to learn things from him. Um, we should have that similar desire to know our heavenly father and to learn things from him. An amazing reality, another amazing reality in scripture, that we are, we're also told that God, our heavenly father, wants us to know him. And specifically, he has spoken to us and he speaks to us. Um, and he does this through his word, okay? Uh, so one reality, biblical reality, is that we are brought into God's family as His children. Another reality is that our Heavenly Father teaches us things and wants us to know who He is. And He does this through His Word. 
Um, we see this a couple places in Scripture very clearly. Actually, there's a lot of places. I'm just going to go to, uh, to go to two. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we're told this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Beginning of the book of Hebrews, uh, we're told that God has spoken to His people in many different ways throughout history. If you go through the Old Testament, you see these examples of prophets and um, all this. And He says, but now He speaks to us through His Son. And how do we know His Son? We know His Son through the writings of the New Testament authors who point us uh, to Jesus. Uh, and in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 70, 17, a passage that may be very familiar uh, to many of you, uh, we're told that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. Um, God has given us His Word, His actual words. Um, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God worked through uh, the writings of broken men um, to give us His perfect words. Uh, and it's an amazing reality that the God who created all things by what? His Word um, has also, is also recreating things through the power of His Spirit through His Word. Okay? Um, God has given us His Word so that we might learn. You notice that He's given it for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Um, God's given us His Word as a loving Heavenly Father so that we might uh, know Him. Uh, and specifically so that we might grow up, so that we might mature in Him. Okay, Not just so that we would know about Him, but that as we know Him more and more, we would grow up and mature um, as His children. And we see that very clearly in Scripture. Let's look at these passages together. Turn with me, if you've got your Bibles, to, to a few places before we get into some of the practical how-tos of listening to God's Word. Uh, let's see where the Bible, how, how it encourages us to see that, we, that God's goal in teaching us is that we would grow up, that we would mature, that we would know more and more about Him and be more and more equipped by our relationship with Him. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. Start there. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. We see this this idea of maturity and growing in Christ mentioned here. Ephesians 4, verse 11, it says, And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, uh, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Um, I, this idea here that God speaks to us, and He does it through all these different means and different ways that in the earlier part of those verses. He's doing it so that we would grow up in Christ and no longer be little immature children who are tossed about by everything they hear. You know, a little kid will kind of believe anything you tell them. Um, and He's talking about that here in the context of believing false things. God wants us to know the truth. Uh, and we know the truth by listening to His words. And His goal is that we would grow up and mature um, in Him. We see a similar theme in Colossians. Turn over to Colossians. It's Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We'll read just verse 28 here. Um, Paul's talking about his ministry and what he does as... Um, as an apostle and teaching and pointing people to Christ. He's talking about why he does it. In verse 28, he says, in reference to Christ, Him, Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works 
within me. And what was Paul's goal? To point people to Christ and by pointing people to Christ to see them grow up, to see them mature um, in their relationship with their Savior. Okay? Um, And then one other place, turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 11, we read this. It says, About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Again, you see this idea, right, of God wanting us to grow up in our faith, to mature in our faith. He doesn't want us to be little immature children. He wants us to grow up and be mature uh, children, okay? Not tiny children, but mature uh, children in, in Christ. Um, and here in this, pra- in this verse, in Hebrews, it's interesting. How is that attained? You know, what are they saying? What are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be working at this diligently. Um, it, it's achieved by constant practice um, in distinguishing good, good from evil. And uh, one thing we pointed out yesterday, and I'll say this again at this point. Our goal, my goal in raising my boys, is that they would grow up and become less and less dependent on me, okay? Um, I don't want them to have to be dependent on me for everything. And it was a joy for me for my son to kill his first year without me. Uh, And I look forward to the day he can do that stuff and a lot of other things without me. I don't want him to live with me forever. Uh, I want him to grow up and move on and do his own thing. And uh, by contrast, though, when we think about maturing in Christ, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, The more we mature in Christ, Uh, the more dependent on Him we become. Um, We never grow out of our dependence on Christ. Um, We grow into it almost. It's sort of a reverse of what we see in our relationships with our families and fathers here on earth. Um, God wants us to learn about Him more and more, and the more we know, the more dependent on Him we become. Um, And the more dependent on Him we become, the more mature in Christ we become, the less we are tossed about in the trials and struggles and difficulties of this life, the more equipped we are at living in this world. Um, Now, that being said, let me ask this question. I think we asked a similar question yesterday. Why is it so difficult for us to listen to God's Word? Specifically, when we think about reading God's Word, what is so hard about it for us? Let me get some ideas. I mean, what are things for y'all that make it difficult to read God's Word and to listen to God's Word? What would y'all say? What are some of the things that are hard for y'all? Or is it easy for all of y'all? What are some things that make it hard? Any ideas? Sin? Okay. Big broad stroke. What else? Taking time. Okay. Actually doing it. Right? Um... I think it's interesting that we're... I've got a list of things, and, but in ke- keeping with that idea of time, uh, listening to God's Word is difficult for us, probably because we're not... Our culture doesn't really train us to listen. Um, I, I could ask, and I don't know if you even would know, but can you think of like maybe the longest song that you know, that you've listened to? I mean, what song might, might that be? Stairway to, Stairway to Heaven. Okay, and how long is that? 10 or 11 minutes, right? That's what I was going to guess, like 11 minutes, okay? Uh, can anybody think of anything longer than that? That's a, that's a pretty good example. I mean, typically, our, our culture trains us to listen. You know, you're, you're used to listening to uh, truth being imparted in 30-minute increments with commercials, okay? Or in two- or three-minute in, uh, increments in a song with a random occasion, a rare occasion, you might get a five-minute song. You might get a, a, a 10- or 11-minute song. Um, but culturally speaking, that hasn't always been the case, okay? 
that's, a, that's something our culture is, is, has accepted and done. Uh, have you ever listened to classical music and tried to listen to a, a whole work of classical music, a whole piece at, at, at one sitting? Um, you know, like, I challenge you to listen to Bach's St. Matthew's Passion. Um, I think it's like three hours, something like that. Imagine sitting there and like having, it, having to perform that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. Uh, culturally, though, there were times when people didn't listen to music all the time, and when they did, they would sit there and listen to it for these long periods of time. We're just not trained to listen like that, are we? Uh, we're not trained to sit and just listen to anything um, and study anything for any length of time. So that's a challenge. What else is challenging to us about listening and learning from God's Word? Anything else you can think of? All right, I'm going to throw out some ideas. I think some of us take it for granted. I said yesterday that I, I grew up in the church, and I think myself, and I think many of you who also have grown up in the church, we kind of take for granted the fact that our Heavenly Father speaks to us. Um, we just, you know, and like we take our parents for granted. You know, many of you probably blow off the vast majority of what your parents tell you. Uh, it's like, eh, I've heard this a thousand times, I'm going to hear it a thousand times again. Um, and yet, we shouldn't take it for granted. Um, we should, we should uh, really learn to, to love and listen to what God has told us. Um, sometimes we just don't want to listen. Sometimes we're stubborn, and when we read God's Word, it challenges us, and we don't want to do what God tells us to do. Um, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes we're too lazy to listen. Um, I would say more often than not, instead of being too lazy to listen, um, I think, by comparison, our lives are probably too crazy to listen. Uh, you know, y'all are very, very busy. Um, your lives are very, very structured. Um, and a lot of times it's very difficult to break those patterns, those structures, in order to take the time to do this and to listen to what God says. Um, you know, a lot of times you're, you're tired at night, you go to bed, and you have to wake up to go to practice for something. And, you, you know, it's hard to figure out where to fit time uh, along with God into your, into your crazy schedules. Um, we don't like silence is another thing I thought about. We don't like to be quiet. It's really hard to sit and be quiet um, and, and, and listen to God's words. Uh, you know, many, some of you probably put music on while you're trying to do this, you know, and, and you're, getting, you're hearing two messages at the same time, you know. Um, it's hard to be quiet. Again, we're not, we're not good at listening. I already said that. Uh, I think a lot of times, how about this? We just don't understand what he's saying. We just don't get it. Um, I mean, could y'all admit that a lot of times when you read God's words, you're like, what is he talking about here? What's going on? Uh, and that's a block for us. You know, that happens. You know, say you start gung-ho at the beginning of a, of a new year. You have a new year resolution. You're going to read through the Bible. And you get to Leviticus. And you totally lose what's going on. And... You try for two or three days and you stop. And, and that's as far I mean, I can't tell you the number of times when I was your age, I tried to read through the Bible, got to Leviticus and stopped. Uh, and it was over and I didn't do it. Because um, we don't understand it. We don't understand exactly what he's saying and how he's saying it to us. So um, I want to give you some practical tips um, now. I want to kind of turn to some practical tips on how we listen. Um, what are some things that help us listen? And I want to give a couple of examples of, uh, of a posture that we should take to God's Word. And then I want to give you a, a number of examples of things that we should practice while we're reading God's Word and listening to God's Word. But first, to begin with, let me tell you a couple of things uh, by way of the posture that we should approach, with which we should approach God's Word when we go to listen to our Heavenly Father. Um, the first thing is we need to approach God's Word with the posture of humility. Okay? Um, we don't listen to God a lot of times because we don't think we have anything that we really need to learn from Him. Uh, a lot of times we feel like we've pretty much got it together. I mean, honestly, when are the times you, that you go to read God's Word? It's usually when something really bad is happening and you realize your life is completely out of control and you start to feel that need and that dependency to go to God's Word. Um, a good example of that, I remember one time my nephew, uh, when he was a young kid, uh, he was probably only like four, and his little sister, who was only like a year behind him, fell and busted her teeth and blood was going everywhere and my sister and her husband were trying to like you know trying their best to stop the bleeding and my nephew was freaked out I mean he was just totally freaked out and so what he did is he went and found his bible or found a bible in the house and he was like you know they're yelling and screaming and trying to calm her down and trying to comfort her and he's like read this to me read this which is sweet um, but that's what you know that's kind of the moments that we go to God's word right when we realize life is out of control 
we realize things are chaotic, we don't know what else to do, so if we can't figure it out on our own, we go to God. We need to start with the recognition that we can't figure it out ever. Uh, you know, being mature in Christ starts with a recognition that we can't figure it out on our own. Uh, we don't know what's going on in life, and we need God to do it. We also, it's so much so, um, well, let me put it this way. I mean, think about, can you remember the example of, it's in all the synoptic gospels of when, uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, people are bringing their kids to Jesus uh, for him to bless them and to lay his hands on them, and the disciples get frustrated because they don't think Jesus has time to mess with the kids. Y'all, y'all remember that story? Y'all familiar with that? Um, and Jesus rebukes them and says, no, unless these people come to me, you know, unless somebody comes to me like a child, they, they can't understand the kingdom of God. Um, and we need to receive the, receive the kingdom of God as a child. I particularly like the, the uh, illustration of that or the example of that in Luke. Uh, the account in Luke says that they, it doesn't just say they're bringing children. It specifically says they're bringing infants to Christ. Okay? So babies. And he says, unless people come like this, they're never going to come. Well, what does that baby bring to the table for their relationship with God? You know, babies eat and poop and cry, and that's it. You can say innocence. Babies aren't innocent. When you have one, you're going to know babies are not innocent. Um, they don't bring innocence to the table. Um, they bring complete dependence. That's all they bring. And he's, Jesus is not saying, unless we come innocently to God, he's saying, unless we come completely dependent on him, we can't have him. Uh, We come to him like an infant because we bring nothing but our dirty diapers uh, and the messiness of our life and our inability. You know, we come to his ability and we bring nothing but our inability. That's the way it works. Um, And so when we come to God's word, we need to come with that recognition that we're coming as people who are clueless. um, And we're coming to a God who knows everything, who understands everything. So we come with that posture of humility and doing that, I think, you know, it causes us to do like the psalmist in Psalm 119. Uh, and he says, Open my eyes, Lord, that I would behold wonderful things from your law. Um, God has to help us see it. Uh, so when we open our word, we come with that sense of complete and utter dependence and saying, Lord, we know nothing. You know everything. Open my eyes so I can see it. Help me see it. Help me understand it. Help me listen. Help me learn from you. Um, so the first part of the posture that we have to take when we read God's Word is that posture of humility, okay? Uh, of saying, we know nothing. God, you know everything. Help me. Teach me. Uh, let me learn. Uh, another aspect of the posture that we should bring to God's Word is, uh, is, and we talked a little bit of this yesterday, we talked about the longing to be with God, but I want to say it today in terms of hunger. Uh, we should come to God's Word with a hunger uh, to learn um, and, a, and a desire to learn. Um, In Psalm 119, verse 20, it says, My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Now, you see the psalmist's hunger there uh, to know God and to know His Word. Uh, Jeremiah 15, verse 16 says this, It says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Uh, For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Okay, Your words were found, and I ate them. Um, and I would suggest this. Some of you are probably like, well, I'm not usually that hungry. Occasionally I'm hungry for God's Word and I want to know, you know, know, know His Word. I would suggest this to you, um, that that hunger grows. Um, God can cause that hunger uh, in your life to know Him more and to know His Word more. He can cause that to grow. And oftentimes He does that uh, through the reading of His Word. Um, sort of the more you eat it, uh, the more you learn to love it, the more you learn to like it. Uh, I mean, almost like eating vegetables or eating some strange new food. You know, and I'm trying to give my kid the other day, we have a fig tree at our house, and I was trying to have him eat a fig for the first time. And he was like, that's a strange, fuzzy thing. I'm not eating that. Um, but it's not like, we, you know, you try something for the first time, and you're like, oh, that's actually pretty good. Um, I think we learn a lot in, through the practice of reading God's Word. We learn to love it more, and we learn to, to desire it more. Um, So by means of posture, when we come to God's Word, we need to come recognizing we don't understand it. We won't get it unless God helps us to understand it. So we come with humility. um, And and, and we should come looking and hungering to see what He's going to show us, to see what He's going to teach us, um, and trying to understand it that way. 
Now, let me talk about some practical things, okay? I'm going to go through a list of practical suggestions for you in reading God's Word. Um, and then, during the courses, recommend um, a lot of other places, books and things you can go to to see these things fleshed out. We just don't have time in a week uh, for me to really go through and give you a lot of detailed I- advice on reading God's Word. But let me give you some suggestions, okay? Uh, first thing, starting point, is you've got to read it. Okay, first practical suggestion. You've got to read it. Uh, you actually have to read it. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would be curious, you know, just think, how many of y'all have actually read through the whole Bible? Uh, how many of you have read the book? You know, you may have seen the movie, or I don't know, you've gone to church, but how many of you have read the whole thing? Um, you know, you claim to be a follower of Christ and a follower of God, and God has given you all this great teaching, uh, and it's there for you. We live in a day and age we can all get one. We can all get it. You can get it on your phone. You can get it. Have, how many of y'all have read it? Um, first practical advice is read it. You need to read it. And tools to use to that end. Um, like I would challenge you. Let me just challenge you in this. If you haven't read it yet, I would challenge you to, to have read through the Bible before you finish high school. At least one time. Um, if you just graduated, I'll say college. Uh, but I challenge you to read through the Bible. And don't wait. Don't say, yeah, I'm going to do that. That's a good goal for my life. No, it needs to be a good goal for this year or for the next couple, two or three years, okay? Uh, you need to do it. You need to read the book. Uh, you need to read his words. Practical applications. Uh, are you all familiar with the idea of a one-year Bible, a book that breaks down God's Word into daily readings? Um, and I didn't, I, I meant to do this and I forgot to do it, but practically speaking, at the average rate of speed that people read, uh, you don't have to read that long every day to read through the Bible in a year. Okay? If you spread it out over two years, you're talking about almost no time at all every day. Um, they sell books called one-year Bibles uh, that break it down into daily readings with dates, and you can, it makes it very easy uh, to do. I recommend that to you. They also have apps that you can get for your phone. That uh, Some of them have the Bible in whatever translation you want with daily schedule. Some of them just have a daily schedule um, that you can just check off and keep a record. I think those are actually better because you don't have to have the, full, uh, the larger app on your phone that has the Bible and the stuff. You know, have your own Bible, uh, but you can use the app just to keep record. You know, it has a daily reading, and you can put a check. You get behind. It's really easy to go back and just check off as you read through uh, the Bible just to keep record of it. Um, so I challenge you, read it. First practical advice. The next thing, next practical advice is this. Steady it. Okay? And don't just read it. Steady it. Listen to what uh, is said in Acts 17. Um, about the folks in, uh, well, this is, it says in Berea. Have y'all ever heard about the Bereans? Sometimes we refer to them as the noble Bereans in Acts 17. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they, uh, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews, it says, were more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica. Why were they more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica? Does anybody know? Because this, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So basically, Paul and Silas go to Berea. They hear what they're teaching, and they want to really see if it's true. So they examine the Scriptures, which means at this point they're examining the Old Testament Scriptures to see if what these guys were saying about the Savior matched up with all the things that had been promised would be true about the Savior. So they're examining all of Scripture, studying it, big checks of it, to see if it was all really and truly pointing to this man named Jesus and to see if he really was the Christ, the promised one. Um, I challenge you, you too also, more than just reading it, you need to spend time in learning how to steady it. Uh, and let me tell you practically what this looks like for you, a, a practical suggestion of in, in steadying God's Word. You need to get the big picture of God's Word. I think on the first night, uh, our speaker was talking about how you need to learn the ebb and flow of the story of Scripture. You need to get the big picture. Now, one way you get that is by reading the whole book. Um, But I would suggest you get the big picture in other ways as well, and that comes by studying God's Word. Uh, Let me give you some suggestions. First, just think about this. Think of your favorite book. Uh, Would you ever really get the ebb and flow of that book if you opened it up and read one sentence at a time? or read a paragraph and then closed it, and then jumped around like a few chapters later the next day and read a paragraph and closed it. That's how we read God's Word usually, right? Um, and we never really get to ebb and flow of it. We, really, we never really know what the story's about because we just kind of open it up, we read a sentence, and we close it. And we, you need to get the big picture. 
Um, and that comes through studying it. Let me give some suggestions. And some of these things are available on the uh, book table in there. Uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible. Have you all used that and read that? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a little Bible story, paraphrase of biblical stories, but it does a really good job. If you're vaguely familiar with a lot of the stories in Scripture, the Jesus Storybook Bible does a great job of showing how all those stories point to the person of Jesus Christ and to God's big picture plan of salvation. Um, a book entitled... Uh, they had a book back there a couple weeks ago. I didn't see it yesterday. called God's Big Picture by a guy named Vaughn Roberts. Um, it was talking just about the big picture of what God is doing in Scripture. Um, there's a book entitled Knowing Jesus Through the Old Testament by a guy named Christopher Wright uh, that does a really good job of showing how we can't understand Jesus if we don't see the whole, the whole Scripture. If we don't study the Old Testament, you never know who Jesus was because Jesus was first and foremost and fundamentally shaped by everything that happened before Him in Scripture. Um, I recommend those, recommend those to you. In, uh, there are plenty of other places you could go. A couple other suggestions. You not only need to read it, you not only need to study it, you also need to meditate on it. Okay? to meditate on God's Word. Psalm one nineteen ninety seven 97 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Uh, what does it mean to meditate on the law? What do you think that means to meditate on God's Word? What y'all say? Any ideas? Chew it. Chew it? Okay. Taste it? Yeah, okay. Try to really get the flavor of it. Um, try to understand, you know, thinking about what that passage really means and thinking what that passage, how it applies to your life. Um, you know, having a verse roll over in your mind for about an entire day and thinking of how it applies. One thing I will tell you this, um, by way of challenge, so a lot of times when we think about meditating, we think about it meaning, you know, sitting and opening God's Word and thinking, what does this passage mean to me? That's one way we think about meditating. And I want to challenge you of the danger of reading God's Word and meditating on it with the framework of wondering, what does it mean to me? I mean, how many of y'all have been in a Bible study, you sit around with a group of uh, friends, and you're reading God's Word, and you go around, well, this passage means to me. When I read this passage, this is what I see. Y'all ever experienced that? Um, I want to challenge you with this, and this is a, kind of piggybacking on the idea of knowing the big picture, the big story. Uh, when you meditate on Scripture, I want to challenge you to not just study a verse, but study a book of the Bible, and learn it in context, because something that you need to realize is true, uh, a passage will never mean anything specifically to you that it didn't, wasn't originally intended to mean to the people who heard it the first time. Okay? God's Word doesn't mean whatever you want it to mean to you. The guys that wrote it had a very specific meaning. Um, and to understand what they meant, we need to understand something about the people that heard it the first time, uh, people that, under, that, that read it or heard it the first time, Understand what did it mean to them, and only when we understand what it meant to the original hearers can we understand what it means to us today. And, and so to that end, you need to study context. When you meditate on a scripture, do it in context of wherever, uh, wherever it was uh, revealed. Practical suggestions for that, having a good study Bible, uh, and there are a lot of them out there. Uh, a Bible that has notes and has a little preface at the beginning of each book that says what that book is about, when it was written, who it was written to. Okay, understand that kind of historical context. And uh, one of my favorite and most helpful books that I've ever been ever had was a gift to me when I graduated from high school, and I still use it now all the time. A book called Talk Through the Bible by uh, by Bruce Wilkinson and Kenneth Boa. How many of y'all do y'all still use Cliff Notes, or do they have other things like that to help you? get ready for tests nowadays. But you know the concept of little book summaries that just give you the highlights, the, you know, the key words, the highlights, the main characters. Talk to the Bible is like cliff notes for each book of the Bible. You get three pages. It gives you an outline, the main characters, the main theme, the stuff, and it's good. It's solid. It's, it's, it's very w uh, well done. And I suggest you read that in connection with studying a passage of Scripture so that when you meditate on it, you're thinking about what it meant in context, not just what it meant to you. Last application, as we're running out of time, is you need to also memorize God's Word. Okay? That's also a challenge for us in our culture today. Um, I've heard it said that in Jesus' day, it was common for teaching in, uh, in teaching young children. is They didn't have the access to the books and literature and stuff that we have. So much of the learning they did was through memorization. Um, and they would memorize huge chunks of books and literature and uh, in, in, in how they studied it. We don't do that anymore. 
Um, but we should do that with God's Word. Psalm 119.11 says this, it says, I have stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Um, I would encourage you and challenge you to make memory, memorization of God's Word something that doesn't just happen at Bible school when you're a little kid. Okay, I know some of you will learn a verse at Bible school for a kid so you can get a sticker. Okay, some of y'all did that. Y'all smiling. Y'all, y'all remember that. Uh, I would challenge you to make that part of the way you look at God's Word now. Okay, they have flashcard apps on your phone where you can do it. There's, a, there's an app called Fighter Verses that's put out by Nav Press um, where it gives you verses and it gives you tools and ways to, to bring that up to you. Another trick I've heard of people putting verses in their calendar um, as an event on their calendar on their phone with reminders. So it pops up every three, four, five hours during the day to help you, to help you memorize it. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it. We used to write out the verses and stick them on the dashboard of our cars. I don't recommend that to you. Uh, my, my sister used to stick it on her steering wheel, and I was like, this is stupid. Uh, you're not a good driver to begin with. Don't, but, but, but the idea is we should learn, uh, we should learn to memorize God's Word. Um, and I'm just joking. My sister is a great driver. I need to say that because these are being recorded and who knows, she may listen to this one day. So, Shannon, you're a great driver. Uh, so, anyway, those are my challenges to you as we learn to listen uh, from God's Word, okay? We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to meditate on it. And we need to memorize it, okay? And use those tools to help us help us listen. And we are two minutes over, so you are dismissed. Stay hydrated. Wear sunscreen. Have a good day.